Welcome to our unit on memory. As you read the textbook, you will find a discussion on the enduring issues. You will also find in the text special topics in memory. One of those topics is about recovered memories where people are in therapy or later in life they remember an incident of sexual abuse or just a spontaneous memory from childhood that they didn't expect. There's also the discussion about reconstruction of memories and how we put memories in our own lens, similar to, um, and you'll learn more here in a couple minutes, like when you talk about fishing and you say you caught this ginormous fish, fish and you say it was 32 inches and then you look at a picture or you talk to somebody who was there and they said, oh, it was 14 inches. So the enduring issue of person and situation says, to what extent can memories be changed by events outside of the person? And what is the importance of environmental cues in triggering memories? And you're going to work through more of this when you um, go through your worksheet. I'm not going to go into as much depth in this PowerPoint because of our obligations this week. Another enduring issue is stability versus change. And you have to wonder, why is it that we don't remember events prior to the age of two? Despite my son having a positive infancy and um, a positive toddlerhood, he won't remember most of it. I'm going to remember it. It's going to be in a scrapbook, but he probably won't recall. Page 208 goes through childhood am amnesia, or they call it infant amnesia. Is it because of the developing brain that we don't remember memories of being born, of our first year of life, our second year? Is it because we don't have language yet? There's certainly some good theories suggested on page 208. Another enduring issue covered in your text is diversity versus universality. Check out page 207 if you're interested in how memory differs across cultures. It really is a fascinating discussion. There are certain cultures whose people show incredible memory and memory skills in certain areas, like remembering every transaction when it comes to their cattle. And you can read more about it in the book. Why is it that they remember? Why do they remember more details than we would in our culture? What do they do differently to be able to remember that? Does that make them more intelligent than you, and, you or I, you or me? You can check out more information on page 207, but the question is, in what way does memory differ among individuals and across cultures? And of course, mind and body has to play a part because memory is a function of our biological, our biological bodies and our biological processes. The textbook reviews in detail the biological basis of memory. We're not going to spend time in our PowerPoint to go through it in detail, but we are going to talk a bit about what are the biological basis of memory. So before we go any further, let's define it. Memory, according to your text, is the ability to remember the things that we have experienced, imagined, or learned. Memory is the ability to remember the things that we have experienced, imagined, and learned. So how does it work? Research suggests the information processing model, and this is a computer-like model where it, humans encode, then they store, and then they retrieve information. And it's a cycle. This model of memory, memory supposes that the information processing begins when information enters one of our sensory registers. So before we can go through the encoding and the storage and retrieval, we need to look at these sensory registers. When we discuss sensation and perception, we identify that there is often much more information than what we absorb. There's a lot going on around me right now in this moment, but I'm only really focused on the transcript that I'm reading from. Why is it that I'm tuning out a conversation in the next room? We discuss the receptor cell's job to give the raw information to the brain to then make sense of. So what are the sensory registers? 
they store this raw data, the sensation that we take in, the colors, the sounds, the smells that we receive through our senses for the information that crosses the absolute threshold. If you remember the absolute threshold, that's the minimal amount, um, like a volume of sound for it to trigger that we need to attend to something. They describe the sensory registers as the waiting room. So this is where the information gathered from your sense, senses that are received by your receptor cells waits to see if you're going to bring this into your memory. The nuts and bolts of the visual register um, is, excuse me, the nuts and bolt is that the information stored in the visual register referred to as an icon, so let's say it is this eye that you see on your screen, it remains there for less than a second. It's constantly being replaced with new information. Even if you stared at the eye on your screen, you might first notice the brown of the iris, and then you might notice the eyelashes, and then you might notice maybe you suppose that an eyebrow hair is out of place. So you're constantly being replaced with new information. And that constantly being replaced is masking. New information replace, replaces old information almost immediately. And this was determined by a gentleman, his last name is um, Spearling. And he, the experiment is detailed in your textbook and it depicts how loosely information is held in the visual register. The textbook also reviews how the information received in the auditory register must remain there um, for a few seconds, making speech comprehension possible. So what happens is the icon, it flashes across us. We have less than a second to decide whether we want it or not as it sits in this waiting room of the visual register because then masking happens and new information comes about. But the auditory register, <coughs> excuse me, there's an echo that lasts, like the echo of the sneeze that just happened, that lasts for a couple seconds to allow that interpretation. Check out page 186. It details these processes in a lot more depth. I love this diagram because it shows thoroughly how this is a sequence of information processing. How does something get from the orange dry erase marker in my hands to my interpretation of that? How did I just do that? I literally just picked it up and I interpreted what this was. I encoded it. I retrieved information. I stored that. It starts with external stimulus. So that's that raw information. Your, um, it's taken in through sensation. Not all that we're presented with is taken in. And then you go to the sensory register and it briefly stores information, either in an icon, which is the visual, or the ecto, which is auditory. Then, then comes attention. And we're gonna talk about attention next. Attention directs the extraction of meaningful information transferring into short-term memory. But in between, you can lose some of it, okay? Attention is defined as the selection of some incoming information for further processing in the short-term memory. If, if you don't attend to it, it's forgotten. Then you go into the short-term memory. It holds the information for a very short period of time. The short-term memory is not responsible for what you ate for breakfast this morning, okay? That's your long-term memory. We're going to talk about what's held in your short term very in, in three minutes or whatnot. It's very short that we'll get to that. If you don't attend to it, I cannot stress this enough, it is. So we defined attention as the process of selecting, selectively looking, listening, smelling, tasting, and feeling. So if you think about that, that sounds like all the senses that we talked about. Attention results in the selection of some incoming information for further processing. These theories that are going to be on your screen are detailed on page 186 and 187. The first theory by Donald Broad Bent says that our attention is a filtering process that takes place at the entrance of the nervous system. 
send the information that passes through the filtering system is compared to what we already know so we can recognize it and figure out the meaning. So if I were to present um, three pictures to you and you could only choose one, um, they would say that you're filtering out the, uh, the two that you don't understand and then the one that you do understand you compare it to previous information and so you can classify it and we'll talk about why ascribing meaning is important to long-term memory. So it's an on or off switch um, at, this, at the entrance of the nervous system which is that raw sensation, that raw information. Then Anne said, Anne Tressman said that, okay, it's a filtering theory, we'll go with that, but the filter is a, is a variable control. It's like a volume control on a radio, not just this on-off switch. Steve says that we don't completely reject signals that we're not paying to. We just monitor them at a lower volume. So our attention can switch from one stimuli to another if we process something meaningful. It's like we're going to talk about the party effect. I mentioned there's a conversation going on in the room beside me. Right now I'm attending to you. I'm attending to the PowerPoint and I'm attending to what I need to say. The cocktail party phenomenon is when you're surrounded by a group of people having conversations, the individual will filter out all of the conversations around him or her. So if you're at a restaurant, you're going to attend to the people with you. If you're on a date, more than likely, hopefully, if you're a good date and you're having a good time, you're attending to the person in front of you. However, if there's someone sitting behind you and they call your name, but maybe they just say, maybe your name is Sarah, which is a common name. If they say Sarah, maybe they're talking to their date and they're far away from your table, but you turn to look. And that's the cocktail effect that at a cocktail party, if you hear your name, you're going to turn to look. You are filtering it all out, but Anne would say it's actually not that you're turning it off, but you're keeping it at a lower volume, and so when you pick up on something familiar, you're going to attend to it. Inattentional blindness, and that's not what it's supposed to say intentional blindness, it's supposed to say inattentional blindness. It's a failure to attend to something we are looking at or listening to. That's when we miss information we're trying to attend to. You are, it's a failure to notice something or be aware of something in plain sight. And being aware is important when you talk about perception and consciousness, which we've already covered. Just because I'm looking at it and listening doesn't mean I'm attending to it. Are you attending right now or are you just listening to me? Is it just going in one ear and out the other? Is the echo just happening but you're not registering it? Is it not going to the short-term memory or then the long-term? By the way, the reason that there's a picture of someone texting on their phone is because attending to auditory information reduces one's ability to accurately process the visual information. And there's research on page 187. So when I am going down the road and I have a long commute and I talk on the phone while I'm driving, I talk because I'm bored and I think it's better than texting, but I can't attend well to both things. And we've already mentioned in the discussion board about multitasking. This just further proves that um, because of you've got your, we're going to talk about your short term memory always being bombarded. It's very difficult to attend to both of those things or to process the visual while you're attending to the audio. And we'll talk about this a little bit more in a couple minutes. So the information crosses our sensory registers, we attend to it, and then it goes to short-term memory. Let's break down the process of short-term memory. First of all, what is it? Um, Short-term memory briefly stores and processes selected information from the sensory registers. Your book gives the example of listening to a conversation, watching TV, or becoming aware of a headache. Again, this isn't what you ate for breakfast. Short-term memory doesn't mean a short time ago. It's really, it should be immediate memory, or working memory is the other name for it. It stores new information briefly, 
works on that and other information. It's very active in the memory system. But how much can be processed at a time? How much can stay in our short-term memory? It can only hold as much information as can be re repeated or rehearsed in approximately one and a half to two seconds. So if you think by listening to this PowerPoint that you're going to understand it just by allowing it to kind of run through your minds, unless you convert it to your long-term memory, that is not going to stay. Check out the exercise at the top of page 189. I'll give you a minute. You can pause this. If you do that, you're going to wonder how in the world do we remember anything meaningful? Well, it's all about chunking. And chunking is something I remember from my Psych 100 class because it was such a weird term to me. Chunking is really the grouping and organization organ, organizing of information so it fits into meaningful units. And it what it does is it improves the capacity of the short-term memory. There is a limit. If you see the exercise in the middle of page 189, go ahead and do that. The middle, not the top. Pause this if you need to. Wasn't it easier to remember the words a second time when they're grouped by terms like FBI and YMCA? The same letters, they're just organized and they're grouped. What's interesting though is that chunking can only, like there's a limit to it. There's a limit to our short-term short memory. Chunking certainly improves the capacity of our short-term but I can remember four words easily, as you can see, um, FBI, YMCA, and so on. But if I were given four sentences that aren't related, it's going to be more difficult. What happens is, is increasing the size of a chunk decreases the available short-term memory capacity. You can only store so much if you think about it. It's like having a phone and you've got a bazillion apps. You just can't download every app there is. There's a limit to it. And if you've ever had multiple apps open at the same time, you know that they tend to process slower. If you have a phone that's not like that, please send me an email so I can upgrade my phone. Just like short-term memory has a capacity when it comes to chunking, it also has other things that negatively interfere with it and can negatively impact it. Short-term memory normally has to process more than one thing at a time. You are normally interpreting information while the sensory registers are gathering new. I mean, this is a very, very quick process. Remember, sensory registers, one, two seconds, yeah? Less than a second for the visual. It sits there in that waiting room until short-term memory can allow it in. There is limited space and working ability for two tasks. Performing two memory tasks of the same sensory modality causes interference, they call it. If you think about football and interference is where somebody grabs the ball and from the other team, right? So that it turns over, possession turns over. When you think about interference here, it's like you've got a competition and you have that person who's trying to grab, grab the space, okay? It decreases performance on one or both tasks. It holds you back. So if you were trying to do two memory tasks at the same time, say you were trying to, um, say you're trying to drive and you're trying to text, you are going to decrease your performance because you can't interpret information from both sources at the same time. But yet when I prepared this lecture, I was listening to music while I put it together, while I gathered the salient information from the text. How is that possible? Well, I'm not using the same sensory modality. I'm using the auditory register and I'm using the visual register. There's less interference. And what happens, what that means is if there's less interference because of the difference, because I'm pulling from visual and audio as opposed to both pulling from visual, then that must mean that there's dominant um, domain specific working memory systems. So there's what appear, and we're going to talk about which areas of the brain are active when it comes to memory. 
So not only does it interference impact um, your ability to hold information in your short-term memory, but also stress and worry does as well. And this isn't a therapist sitting around saying stress negatively impacts. This is research-based, and you can see the research on 190, on page 190. Stress impedes the performance of working memory tasks. Worry caused by stress takes up working memory capacity. And so you should be using that to deal with other things. So if you're stressed about a math test, so you sit down to a math test, you have less working memory available in order to perform well. So you are essentially splitting your time. You could be wholly focused, wholly attending to the problem at hand, but half of your space is devoted to worrying, if not more. You are going to perform worse. See the research on page 190 if you want to. And I would encourage you to remember that next time you sit down to a test that there is research that says stress and worry is going to reduce my ability to perform well. Before I go further, I just want to want to say that this reminds me of the children that I've worked with with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. Those that undergo neuro, um, neuropsychological testing often show to have what they call low working memory or processing speed. And ADHD is a lot more than hyperactivity. It is a limited ability to attend to tasks, which is particularly detrimental to kiddos or adults under certain circumstances. It's very similar to that math test scenario. If you only had half of your working memory, you would perform worse. You would not have enough room to hold the information. It's like you will only remember half of the phone number of the female you're trying to talk to. My kiddos with ADHD have difficult time holding on to information. And this is why, because they're working, they have a smaller capacity of their short-term memory. But yet they're able to tell me like an entire script of a TV episode. How is this? How is this that they're able to do that but can't remember to brush their teeth, grab their book bag, and put on their coat? There's what's called rope rehearsal, and this is both for short-term and long-term memory. And this is repeating the information over and over and over again. This is how we hold information in the short-term memory before it gets sent off on the way. If you're going to the grocery store for your family members, someone might yell out to you saying, I'm going to the store, they say, grab some milk or grab whatever, grab me some Snickers. Someone, so you, you're told what to grab, they tell you what they want. Chances are that you do one of three things. You either practice that several times, oh yeah, they said they wanted Snickers. You write it down, or you forget. Rote rehearsal is that repetition. You say it to yourself a couple times. Oh yeah, I gotta grab Snickers. I can't forget the Snickers. He always, why does he always have to ask me for something as I'm walking out the door? Before we progress to long-term memory, page 190 reviews how information is encoded in the short-term memory. Like how is it, how is it, um, if you think about a computer, how is it encoded? Like what's the code given to it? Is it, is it um, stored visually? Is it stored, is the auditory stored? Is it the picture? Um, it depends on how it's presented and what we need to remember. And I would encourage you to read page 190. They do say that like, if you look at the word memory on your screen, that you store that phonetically. You don't store that even though you're reading it. So if you're seeing it visually, you would store it in an auditory form. But that's not always true in 190 details why. Let's go on. Can we keep moving? Um, obviously, we remember a lot more than what happened five seconds ago or a minute ago. What is long term memory, though? It's not your memories from childhood only, it's where we store all the information that we learn. We're going to go into learning soon that we need to hold for an indefinite period of time in order to be able to complete complex tasks, receive an education, remember personal experiences that contribute to our identity. But it's, it's more or less permanent, it's everything you know. It's how to tie your shoes, it's what, how the first day of kindergarten was for you. It stores a lot of information for many years. 
where short-term memory is encoded phonetically or visually, long-term memory is normally encoded based on meaning. I mean, some memories are encoded in terms of nonverbal images, like shapes and smells and tastes. But yet, the most meaningful aspects of a given period of time are most memorable. So like in my lectures, you're not going to remember word for word, right? But you do need to understand the main point. In your memory, you are remembering the meaning. And this whole unit, what you might remember is that if you were diagnosed with ADHD as a child, you may think, oh, that's why I can never remember two things at once is because I have low working memory. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this, but there's what's called um, the serial position effect. And what's interesting about it is when we're given a list of items to remember, like a grocery items, you tend to do better about recalling the first items, which is the primacy effect, and the last items, which is the recency effect in the list. You tend to do worse about the information in the middle. The reason why, and this shows how long-term and short-term memory work together, the ones on the first are easiest to remember because there's been time to rehearse them, and they're more likely stored in long-term memory. Milk and Snickers is what he said he wanted. The last items are the on the list are easiest to remember because they're the last thing stored there. But the ones in the middle, the ones in the middle you spent the least amount of time because you didn't rehearse them, so you didn't get them in long term, but yet it, you have to store the last items so they get pushed out of the short term memory. Does that make sense? The first ones, you end up, because it's been enough time that you end up with them in your long term memory, you had time to practice them. The middle ones kind of get neglected because they're not in the short-term memory and they're not in the long-term memory. It's better explained on page 192. I really do love the concept. I just don't have the time. This is why if you want Snickers, put them at the top of the grocery list. So if you don't bring the written list with you, how do you know what you want to buy at the store? How do you actually remember? How does it end up in your long term? There are multiple processes used to hold information in the long term. You have rote rehearsal, which again is very useful for storing conceptually meaningless information like phone numbers or social security numbers. And it's just repeating information over and over again. 7 times 7 is 49. Well, I did that about a bazillion times in fourth grade. It's not, it's tedious practice, and it's not very useful without the intention to learn. What's nice about it is it can make information or skills automatic so that the information can be ac accessed from the long-term memory accurately and without thinking about it. There is certain information that's gotta be processed this way. And this is why practice makes perfect when it comes to playing the piano, doing a sport, reciting a poem from um, verbatim from memory. It's because you want that automatic pulled from long term, not having to overly focus on it. A better way to store things in your long term memory is to um, do elaborate rehearsal. And this is relating the new information in your short term memory to information that's already stored in your long term memory. The more associations that you make with the new information, the more likely it is that you're going to remember it. And this is consistent with some research you can read about in your book. That's why I give analogies, especially in on-ground classes, because then it allows you to connect those dots. Let me see what the students say. I want to see so I can connect with the material. This is why, because that's how you remember it. When you do a group activity in a on-ground setting, or even if you do one online, you're, and it's a little crazy, you're more likely to remember it because you connect with it, it's novel a lot of times, and you create that sensation and you can connect it with other experiences. That's why when you meet someone for the first time and they say their name, it's awesome to connect that with something that you already know you can relate to so that that way you can retain who they are. 
mnemonics is making words or sentences out of the information or out of the material in order to recall it later. This is like um, giving, having a song for um, the months of the year. Um, there's a song that my husband sings so that that way he remembers, and I think it's related in your book as well. That added meaning or structure makes the material easier to store and retrieve from the long-term memory. And I do this with my son all the time. If I want him to remember something or for something to become like a ritual, then I want to add a song to it or I'm going to add some kind of phrase to it and it's so it will be remembered. Your book does a really nice job going into schemas. And this is a, we talk about this a couple times, we'll come back. A schema is a mental representation of an event, person, object, something along those lines. It's like a frame to put, to put around a concept. And it's stored in your memory and you expect your experiences to be organized in certain ways. Like a class schema might be sitting at a desk, taking notes, listening to a professor give a lecture. And then a schema provides a framework through which all in incoming information is filtered. And so then we end up with stereotypes. And stereotypes are often seen as negative, and they often are negative. However, the reason we have them is so that we can, we have a box that we want to put around people. Um, I'm not going to name any in particular because a lot of them, again, have negative connotations, but it's, we tend to ascribe certain characteristics to all members of a group because we have that experience. And those schemas and those stereotypes are hard to break because of the schemas. Um, there's a lot more on page 194. I wish I could spend the time to process it and I would encourage you to look at that. Page 195 has a really nice summary table. If you want to look at that, we're going to actually look at memories next, actual memories. The first type of long-term memory I want to talk about is, are the long-term memories of personally experienced events. These type of memories allow us to relive our experiences, but they also allow us to plan for the future. These are personal memories, they're not historical facts. The next type is personal, these are the facts. These are long-term memories about general facts and information. The book talks about, um, your book says here that it's like the location of the Empire State Building. Um, what, what the value of two times seven is, or the identity of George Washington. Those are all schematic memories. Procedural memories are long-term memories um, that stores information related to skills, habits, and any kind of perceptual motor task. So, you can always ride a bike again. These are memories that are rarely forgotten. You never forget how to ride a bike, they say. Okay, that's what a procedural memory is. An emotional memory is a learned emotional response to varying stimuli. And I, unfortunately, this, this picture on the screen freaks me out. And you'll learn why when we talk about learning in the next unit. But just for now, keep in mind that emotional memories are learned emotional responses to various stimuli, whether it's a fear response when seeing a spider, feeling ashamed, at the memory of something that you did or feeling pride when remembering a past success. Trauma seems related to this type of memory as well as our personal memory and sometimes procedural. And we're gonna get into that. Explicit memory is um, our personal memories and then our schematic memories. We're aware of knowing something. Mem this is memory for information that we can readily express in words and we're aware of having this. We can intentionally retrieve this information. Implicit memory is memory for information that we cannot readily express in the words, may not be aware of having, and they can't be intentionally retrieved. If you're listening to this, then you will know that your worksheet, every one of yours, is going to be an explicit memory. And this is procedural and emotional memories are the implicit but you aren't aware of knowing something. 
So if you're relaying in your worksheet the memory, then you're aware of it, so it makes it explicit. There is some, some support for explicit and implicit memory distinction, and they talk about post-traumatic stress disorder on in your book. And then there's also a client's a client with amnesia's case, page 196 and 197, and it is fascinating to read. And they talk about well, I'm not going to go into it, but if you would you would read about it, you would see the evidence that explicit memory operates separately from implicit memory. There's a summary table on page 197 for the types of memory. I'm not going to go through this, but on page 195, it reviews how to improve your memory. If you want to, you can always pause this and review these tips. So what's the biology of memory? We're just going to superficially discuss how and where are memory is stored. The answer is not completely understood or known. I'm sure you're finding that um, quite frequently in what we're talking about. We study neuroplasticity and we know that experience, remember it's a loop. We have experience, feedback, experience again. It leads to neurological changes. We also study the effects of stimulants on our experience as humans. Sometimes these are permanent. It all goes back to neurons. It all goes back to neurotransmitters. So you shouldn't be surprised that memory is neuro-based as well and neurotransmitter-based. Memories consist of changes in the synaptic connections among neurons. And this is cite, the researcher cited in your book on page 198. New experiences equals new connections. When you practice old actions, it strengthens the, it strengthens the existing connections. In addition to neurons, memory also seems influenced by hormones, all this is reviewed on page 199. Um, the information on your screen is reviewed. I'm not going to go through it, but it is. It is not all memories are stored in one place in the brain. It's not like if you bang something on the back of their head, their memories are gone for forever. The storage of memories, because remember, memory is more than just what happened when I was five. It was, it's remembering how to tie my shoes. The storage of the memory involves a lot of different neural networks in the brain, and this shouldn't be a surprise to you after chapter two. As a general rule, the area of the brain involved in encoding the event are reactivated when the event is remembered, and this is, put quotations marks around this, returning to the brain state that was present during, and I said the word event. And the researchers are cited in Morse and Masto, our books, on page 199. So our short-term working memory seems to be located primarily in our prefrontal cortex and our temporal lobe. Our long-term schematic and personal memories are stored in the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe. Our personal memories also appear to be in the frontal and temporal lobe, but they rely on the integration of specific sensory areas of the brain, and you can see that on your screen. And then the procedural memories are in the um, cerebellum and the motor cortex. But the hippocampus, we said, is involved in the formation of new memories, and then the amygdala is involved in the limbic system, it's all about our emotional brain, and that's involved in emotional memory. There's a lot of information, page 200, 201. I would encourage you to read through it. It is worth the time. What about sleep? Well, this shouldn't be a surprise to you because we've already talked about it. We know sleep serves to restore us mentally, and we discussed in Chapter 4 that it helps us remember what's learned. It appears that the same hippocampal ner <laughs> neurons and patterns of neuron activity that accompany initial learning are reactivated during the sleep to follow that learning and it strengthens those new memories. Memories are more than what you did at five. So we go to sleep, it plays an important part in formation of new memories, and then we can see that activity in the brain. There's more information if you want it in your text. If we're going to about memory, we got to talk about forgetting. Forgetting is once formed, memories do not remain forever in the brain. Well, what theory is what causes forgetting? 
The decay theory is that there, there's a passage of time, that memory deteriorates with the passage of time. And it's partly responsible for the forgetting in the short-term memory, but also in the long-term. Retrograde amnesia is when you have a head injury and then you lose information in the long-term memory. And the person can't remember what happened shortly before the information, probably because the information wasn't fully integrated into the long-term memory. It's interesting because there's a type of amnesia linked with alcoholism, and it's due to a vitamin deficiency. That's in your book, page 203. And then Alzheimer's is associated with um, below normal levels of a certain neurotransmitter and obviously forgets, um, it, it leads to forgetfulness. And it's interesting because not just those with Alzheimer's, not just elderly with Alzheimer's struggle with not remembering. Um, there's a lot of elderly people that will complain about that. And they will say that there's alterations in the hippocampal functioning and connectivity to other areas in the brain. And that research is on page 203. It's not just biological factors that influence um, forgetting. It's also environmental factors. If we're not fully paying attention, we're being quote-unquote absent-minded. We don't rehearse the information adequately. Your book says it well, you cannot remember well what we have not learned well. And I'm going to use that hopefully for the rest of my life. Because I love that quote, we cannot remember well what we have not learned well. But sometimes we're learning too much at once. You have this um, proactive interference, and that's when old information interferes with new information being learned. It's like you used to park in one, one area, um, you go back. You have to park in a new area, let's say because of construction. You go back for your car and you go to that old area. Well, that's learning. You've learned to go there and that's proactive interference. Retroactive in interference is that information learned later interferes with information learned earlier. So it's like getting a new phone number. Well, once you have your new phone number memorized, you maybe will forget your old phone number. There's also the concept of if you are working with dissimilar things, like um, if your your family member says get um, milk and Snickers, okay? I need to get milk and Snickers, but those are dissimilar; they're not the same. But if you if they said, can you please get peanut butter Snickers, and will you please get me the mini size full um, regular Snickers? You might get to the store and you might think, well, which one do they want the mini size of and which one do they want the full of? The saying that it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks goes with that, um, that concept that similar items are more likely to interfere with each other than dissimilar items. So there's a state-dependent memory, and this is where if you learn material in a specific um, physiological state, you tend to do better to recall that information in that same state. And your book goes into more details. Then there's this reconstructive nature of memory, and this is where um, you use your schema to reconstruct a memory, so you're unable to differentiate with what actually happened and what you think happened, which leads to an alter alteration in the memory of the event. So like think about eyewitness testimonies, and that's discussed at length in your book and in the TED video. Did you actually see that, or is that just how you interpret it? We talked about one's perception is one's reality. Well, one's memory is based off of one's perception, okay? So when you do your worksheet, you're going to consider how have you reconstructed it? How have you done it for social reasons or personal defense or just the fact that you didn't fully grab everything? I think this table, which is why I included it, summarizes nicely all the factors that, forget, that affect forgetting. And then these are the special topics of memory. I'm not going to go through them, but if you want to read the PowerPoint slides, I'm going to pause each one and you can pause them, or I'm going to go through each one and you can pause them and look at them.
And that concludes our conference.